Hello, Internet. Gino, a.k.a. That Pinguino Grieco, here again with another episode of Deep Listens. With me on the call, I have Billy, radio voice Rother. Hi, everybody. How's it going tonight? You claim to have a really good radio voice. You know, I don't just claim, uh, but where I work, I have to make announcements regularly, and you don't even realize how many people say, Hey, man, you got a great, like, radio voice. You should do radio. My response is, like, you think I'm not good looking enough for TV? I mean, you can definitely hear the seduction in your voice. I mean, it's just there. <laughs> Look who's talking. That's a good Pete. point. And that's, that's our, other, our other regular guest. Pete, imagine me handsome Busby. <laughs> it's not hard. It's not hard to imagine me that way. It's pretty that's easy when you come up with a work of fiction like that. That's a good point. Uh, so this week uh, we are going to be talking about Fallout 3 and Apocalyptic Games and some other stuff Uh, unfortunately no feedback yet on Psychonauts Uh, we do record a little bit ahead of time so it's possible that we'll get some Psychonauts, some hot Psychonauts emails in between now and then Um, if we get an email that's especially good to thatpinguino at gmail.com I can always, we can always bring it up in later episodes Uh, if a email is good enough it can always be added to the discussion at a (laughs) boy so i i think without further ado let's get into fallout 3 the goodness that is fallout 3 okay well let me start us off then with sort of some critical touchstones we're going to look at today so today we're mostly going to focus on sort of apocalyptic games and how they relate to sort of Thomas Hobbes's vision of the state of nature and hopefully by the end we'll all sort of realize that Thomas Hobbes might have been kind of a tool (laughs) now yeah obviously I haven't read all of Hobbes's oeuvre because he has tons of stuff and you probably don't want to read all of it but we can make do sort of with pop Hobbes today so everybody knows sort of I shouldn't say everybody maybe there's a lot of overlap in our listeners and Hobbes fans I don't know I'm but a the, huge fan of Calvin and his work with Hobbes. Yes. One of the most important part of Hobbes' philosophy has to do with stuffed tigers, obviously. We're going to shy away from that today, though. I, mean, Fuck. Mostly, I know. I know. <laughs> oh, man. I'm so good at that part, though. His That's work like, with the, the little Gino, kids. please. Gino, please. <laughs> I have the anthology of Calvin and Hobbes, like, actually. Great. I have one of them, too. Leather bound. Leather. <laughs> All color. Now I'm disappointed we're not talking about it. But what I was saying, so we're going to focus mostly on Pop Hobbes. So the one phrase, if you know one from the Leviathan, is Hobbes saying, the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. Right? Have you guys heard this phrase? Um, no, but it makes it sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I feel like apocalyptic games as a genre are very invested in this sort of vision of the state of nature as nasty, brutish, and short, right? Like once society breaks down, people just start killing each other. It's what we do, right? Think of it as the Mad Max vision of the apocalypse, right? Everybody's looking for, if we're talking old school, everybody's looking for gasoline, right? And there's just water. Rope, or water. Oh, you yeah. mean they're looking for guzzoline and aquacola? Yes, Yes, and they're just sort of roaming the wastes looking to pillage and murder, right? But that's not necessarily the way the apocalypse works, right? Now, obviously, we've not studied the apocalypse. It'd be a little bit difficult. But if you look at the way people behave during just catastrophes, catastrophic situations, the sort of default reaction is typically one of pro-social behavior, right? People are trying to sort of establish these norms of behavior and then follow them very closely, right? It's sort of the default state of nature isn't one of atomized or individual predation. It's one of sort of global empathy. If you can extrapolate from catastrophes like the earthquake in Haiti or Hurricane Katrina, right? And if you extrapolate those behaviors to the apocalypse, you can use that as sort of a guideline. So that's where I want to start the conversation, right? If we're looking at Fallout 3 as a model of the apocalypse, do we think it's more invested in sort of that Hobbesian narrative of individual predators or sort of global predation, nasty, brutish, and short? Or does it more closely follow this empathic model? 
are people setting up more pro-social structures, more sort of helpful, empathic social units, let's say. So let's start there. Okay. Um, I guess my knee-jerk reaction is when you say that post-apocalypse, sorry, post-disaster events, events like earthquakes or hurricanes, the general response was empathy and focusing on like social reconstruction as opposed to everything descending into chaos. Yep. I think I agree with that in almost all like areas in which you would agree. There is all, always some people that want to pillage and loot, but I'm not going to dwell on that too much because normally they get shut down. And I think the reason they get shut down is because even though a hurricane occurs in one particular part of the, the world or the nation, the rest of the world didn't get hit by that same hurricane. So society lives on outside this little bubble of disaster. This is one point that I might want to draw a distinction between, like I'm not saying it's a bad an analogy or a bad example, but fallout is going to be different from an earthquake because fallout, as far as we know in the game, happened across the entire planet. And there's no pocket where the disaster occurred and then the rest of the world is fine so billy are you kind of saying that because there is a larger social context that is surrounding this disaster area that that is what is enforcing the empathy that there are people in this disaster zone i'm just asking because i'm not sure exactly why yes mr grieco <laughs> okay so you're saying that because people feel the the eyes of the rest of the world looking in on them rather yeah. than necessarily banding together out of a sense of communal just strength and empowerment like we all need to band together through this they feel like oh crap the rest of the world is watching we'd better not do some messed up shit to each other because when the rest of the world comes back in here and society kind of calms down there'll be repercussions whereas in fallout the repercussions are if you get shot you get shot no one's really enforcing law yeah. Right. I mean, that world repercussion is probably a factor, but I'm thinking more like society has not collapsed as a whole. It still exists and can just be spread back into this disaster area. Whereas in Fallout, though, maybe, you know, I probably know less about the lore of Fallout since this is the first time I played a Fallout game and, you know, I didn't get completely to the end of the game. It seems like the whole world has, you know, turned to shit and there's no model of society to draw from. That's part of the whole reason why we're discussing the fallout societies is that the ones that show up that we're going to talk about are the ones that I guess are interesting because in the wasteland, there's just who's got the gun and other stuff. I actually would disagree. Um, in fallout, I think there are several societies that are set up that obey structure, like structured societal norms that we would recognize now. Uh, you've got the town of Megaton, which is the very first town you come across. Uh, mm -hmm. Vault 101 might be a very patriarchal society, but it is a society. There is a rule of law there. Um, Rivet City is largely dedicated to science and the betterment of mankind. Um, Little Lamplight's a town you go to. It's a child-based society. Um, big Town. <laughs> big Town's another place which is all uh, people who leave Little Lamplight. Again, a little society. Um, there are, are several pockets of civilization where people are banding together, usually around a charismatic leader or a series of rules where they are trying to bring back some semblance of society or some structure that resembles the world from before. You're, now, you're in, right. the, in the wasteland, there's no overwhelming, un, until the enclave kind of comes in and tries to impose law on everyone, um, there is no central governance but there are still people who you will run across who are not there to kill you or take your stuff they are there they will help you they will talk to you like i ran across a couple of hunters and stuff that will offer to sell you things and will you'll just pass like two cars in the night um that's that's right i mean i uh, i agree with your point about there being pockets of civil civilization what i was actually like pointing to was Right after the disaster hits, and, like, in the world that we live in today, there's a couple days before, like, FEMA gets there, before, you know, military aid gets there, before any kind of help or any kind of community rebuilding aid gets there. I'll bet you, in the fallout world, there was a couple years there where 
there was no rivet town there was no so there was no rivet city there was no megaton there was no anything and i wasn't trying to discredit rivet city or megaton or <laughs> any of those places that you run into in fallout but what i was pointing at more was like the closest time post like post disaster in our world, there's still worlds standing outside of you. But if the world really did, in the Fallout universe, have this sort of nuclear winter, this nuclear destruction of the whole Earth, then where do you look towards to rebuild society? It has to happen over a long period of time when enough people get together who want the same things. That's when you get Megaton. That's when you get Rivet City. That's when you get um, the other towns. Uh, there was that weird, creepy town that people were eating each other but it was Arafu? nice no not arafu but oh. um snap oh. we're like it was all too hot like too nice and happy but then you dug deep and they were like oh, oh, they were people eaters i can't remember the name now yeah, can I? i'm looking um, it up no it was speak. like it was like the best little city uh it was like a, like ableton or something like that or oh man and utopia berg and dale is what it, what is what it was called and dale virginia yeah and dale that's it and uh, they, they were like the creepiest town because you'd go talk to people and they were like, oh, it's so nice out today. And like, just trying to feed my family and like any red blooded American man does. You don't know that they were actually just eating anyone who walked uh, who walked by. But yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Societies existed, but I'm sure post Great War, as they called it, there was none of that because you had nothing else as a point of reference. I, I appreciate what you're saying, Billy, but I think you're underestimating sort of the internally driven, uh, what do I want to say, efforts of the individuals, right? Like, I'm, I'm springing research on you at this point because obviously I'm the one who's, who's done a little bit of it. Yeah, I'll take that as valid criticism. Yeah, if you look at sort of discussions of, let's see, like the people in New Orleans, right? If you look at sort of quotes about them, like people were saying how the individuals within New Orleans acted as their own first responders, Right. They were the ones independent as yet of sort of military or FEMA intervention setting up these initiatives. And what they needed after that was not so much security forces, but more just increased relief efforts, right? Like there's no sort of dissent in anarchy even following these, maybe initially, right, where people aren't sure what's going on. But very quickly, the individuals themselves start setting up these efforts, right? So even that's why I think this extrapolation is reasonable, because even in a case where society as a whole might be gone, these individuals who have survived will, I think at least, start to set up these initiatives themselves, will start to engage in this pro-social behavior. I can agree with that. Yeah, and I, I, I definitely saw, uh, I saw a Vice um, expose on Haiti post-earthquake, uh, and a lot of the largest areas of... Um, civilization and kind of a return to some kind of normalcy were Haitian made Haitian run settlements that did not receive aid from the U S or from outside interlopers of any kind that basically were people banding together with no oversight, with no expectation of receiving anything that they don't have running water and all that stuff, but there is still some kind of civilization and some amount of rule of law. Mm -hmm. People are not just murdering and killing and no. It's not like in Haiti, even now, after the earthquake, it's not like people are roaming around with guns, just taking what they can. Yeah. And now, obviously, there's sort of, there, there's tons of politics and economics and sociology implicit in any discussion of sort of the earthquakes, Hurricane Katrina, any natural disaster. So, I mean, we don't need to get sort of too far into this. Just looking at these behaviors serves as sort of an, ex, let's say, an expectation for the apocalypse, right? If this is how people behave in catastrophe generally, what can this tell us about the apocalypse? So we, we can use this as a jumping out point without sort of looking at the specifics of these individual situations. I think that'd be fair. Yeah, sure. I fair mean, enough. I yeah. think that the interesting part of the Fallout 3 wasteland is how, like I said, how all of these different charismatic people kind of set up their own versions of civilization that are most accommodating for their own needs large by and large uh, megaton is one of the closest things to i mean it's not a democracy but it looks like some sort of democratic state um everyone is kind of getting their needs met in different ways uh, religion is respected there even when it's a cult that worships an atomic bomb <laughs> um 
There are shops set up that are kind of operating freely. There is a sheriff slash mayor, depending on what need, what need uh, Lucas Sims needs to fulfill. <laughs> there's a bar. There's people have jobs. People have functions. Um, they largely band together. Then you've got places like the Republic of Dave. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> which I don't know if you found. <laughs> yeah, Dave. I did. But it is just Dave who overthrew the kingdom of Tom <laughs> and brought democracy to the wastelands. Um, he basically set up a demo- It is a democracy in by the letter of the law, but by yeah. the spirit, it is not at all. Literally, <laughs> everyone has a vote, and everyone votes. All one. <laughs> everyone votes Dave. Actually, you can overthrow that, and I kind of want to talk about overthrowing patriarchies in this oh, in this oh world boy. a little bit later. But yeah, I, you get to it. I think that um, the different examples of people banding together, even the people who are the most despicable, uh, for example, the people in Paradise Falls, um, even they seem to value some semblance of society, even if it is not a society we would want to live in. They see the value in resurrecting some type of rule of law. Their laws are slavery and exploitation of weaker classes, people that they can directly gain control over, but they don't want anarchy. Like, you can go into um, Paradise Falls and talk to people without having a gun pulled on you. They won't immediately take you because they, they see a value in slave trade. They see a value in setting up themselves as a leader of some sort of society or an agent within a greater society. Um, so even the most despicable evil people, the murderers, want a market for, for their their slaves. They can't, uh, they can't profit without it. There needs yeah. to be some structure or else they can't make anything happen for themselves. That's an important, an important point you're making too, Gino, very important. To say that sort of the behavior is antithetical to this Hobbesian narrative is by no means to say they're setting up an ideal society, right? To say that their behavior is pro-social doesn't necessarily mean it's nice. It just means the state of nature isn't anarchy. It isn't atomized individual predation. It's sort of these complex social structures, even if we find them reprehensible. Yes, there's a lot of lawful evil in yes. Fallout. Yes. Not good, as, good way to put it. There is chaotic evil, there is lawful evil, but the chaotic evil is usually represented as characters that you are capable that you are fine to kill because they will be enemies immediately they will have nothing to say the they raiders will never yeah. try to help you you don't care about them raiders never talk they mole never rats care. too like the things that are elements of pure anarchy are purely represented as enemies in the game rad roaches chaotic evil yes rad roaches are chaotic <laughs> evil i would say they are chaotic neutral <laughs> They just want to roach around, do roach yeah, stuff. Yeah, just trying to roach, man. I think what struck me most, though, in terms of sort of this discussion of pro-sociality, if I can coin a phrase that I'm not sure is a phrase. You did it last time. I'm not going to stop you this time. Yeah, right. pro-sociality. Even within this context of sort of societies around the protagonist forming, you still have a lone, atomized individual protagonist, right? And it's sort of... It's maybe not smart to attribute intentions to a character you're controlling because those intentions are largely dependent on what you do with them. But there's sort of no impetus to actually join one of these societies. You pass through Megaton Town. You pass through pretty much any place you want without actually joining necessarily. You know what I mean? Like there's no forced sociality of the protagonist. So even as we're creating these societies, we're still advancing some part of this Hobbesian narrative of the independent lone survivor of the apocalypse. And I think that's what struck me largely, sort of the investment in this lone survivor mentality. How did you guys, um, I guess, build your persona in game? Like, what was your guys' karma and stuff? Ooh, uh, this actually, I had a pretty elaborate... Uh, I saw Mad Max Fury Road recently. Yes. <laughs> so you just build around that. You build Mad Max. <laughs> um, my character's name was Lady Johannesburg the Third. You made a girl character too. Yes, I made a girl. 
And my goal was to destroy as many patriarchies as I could within the game. Oh, that man. My, <laughs> that was my established goal. I, at first, I found Good the, sex, I found the uh, naughty nightgown by accident. And I got one I, of those, too. I wore that and a fedora. And then I just went about being lawful good, but mostly I directly made beelines for all the areas that I knew were patriarchies and set about destroying them in some way or shape or form. So I rigged the vote in the Republic of Dave so that Rosie won. And so now that makes that actually makes Dave leave the Republic of Dave. Dave just bounces when he can't assert his western ideal if he loses the election he just leaves and he says he's going to go annex uh, a nearby ruin and if you follow him he will actually go to that ruin and it is full of death claws and they will kill him death claws. which were amazing I, that was amazing um i then went to paradise falls and killed everyone because you can't really <laughs> you can't convince them that to give up slavery and patriarchy you really can't that's great like there are all these machiavellian intrigues in the republic of dave like ooh, how am i gonna rig this election then i just went to paradise falls and murdered everyone i i was like let me talk to uh eulogy jones and see what he has to say let's see if i can convince him that slavery is wrong he doesn't care there's no so dialogue I, option to do that i guess the reason why i threw that question out was because we all played this game, but depending on how we created our characters and things, we could have had radically different experiences. Like, like we mentioned that no particular town or settlement like directly adopted us or we directly joined them. Um, and that's true. Like, it, it was never forced upon the player. But I got a house in Megaton, and every time I went there, yeah. people started giving me gifts and presents because I basically became this like saint of the of the wasteland. Um, doing pretty much everything um, like karma good on a second playthrough, I like to do everything karma evil and just see how directly opposed the two uh, the two playthroughs are. So, yeah, it's you're right that no place actually does say you're joining us, like you're going to be a part of our town now, or gives you the direct option. You kind of have to stumble upon it yourself. Um, but if the player wanted to, they could set up a little a little establishment for them like i always went back to megaton not only because it was cool like that i was had this little house but also in game it was useful that i had a place to store all my crap like you have like lockers and stuff in your house that no one goes into or messes with so it was it was it was convenient as well um i will say that i probably did not see as many of the cities as i as i could have or should have um i saw probably only six towns in my playthrough uh, partly because i got the like the game of the year edition and didn't know that I was actually playing like 20 hours of DLC content on a spaceship. Um, <laughs> that was really weird. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I put like 40 hours into the game and like 25 of them were in missions that ended up being just completely off story DLC. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, yeah. I, it's actually interesting. You mentioned coming back and kind of having a sense of home, even though the game does not say that Megaton is your home, because there are a lot of different uh, locations that once you make some big, impactful um, kind of, you know, you do something in that society. You could have blown will... up Megaton. <laughs> what yeah, if they did you, that? If you blow up Megaton, then when you go to um, Tenpenny Towers, then that's your home. You get a uh, apartment in yeah. Tenpenny Towers and they reward you. So, uh, like, Big Town, if you solve their problem with super mutants, they will, like, all the people there will say, oh, my God, you're the hero of Big Town. Way to go. And, like, some of the characters will give you stuff. Or you could, uh, also you get healed for free. So if you go back to Big Town, uh, the, the um, doctor there will just heal you for free. Um, if you save Arafu, they are a people who are beset by cannibals who have convinced themselves they're vampires. So if you deal with their vampire problem in a suitable way, they will give you stuff. Uh, if you help out the vampires by not murdering them all, they will give you stuff and say, hey, you've taught us not to kill people anymore. Thanks. And so if you do the good, the kind of the lawful good option, you build this network of 
NPCs who consider you friendly and will help you along in your journey. So kind of the quid pro quo there I think is interesting that once you do something for someone else, they will then do for you. And not only do for you, but every time you come back, they will continue to reward you. Now, in terms of story impact and dialogue, like the payoff is really minuscule. Like the change in dialogue is not yeah. significant. But the feeling of going back over and over again and accumulating those rewards kind of it gives you something that makes it not completely trivial that these people are helping you. Um, I wish that the story payoff was better. Like I wish that rigging the election so that Rosie won instead of Dave actually made her start enacting changes to the Republic of Dave. Like the Museum of Dave becomes like a schoolhouse or something. <laughs> but um, the game's not that, unfortunately, it's not that deep with that stuff. But. Funny you brought up Arafu because I think that's a, that's a pretty good example of how you could have chosen different options like to help or to leave things as they were. And things did kind of change because – the situation in Arafu, when you followed that blood ties mission to completion, uh, ended up drastically changing that dynamic. So even though that might have been one area where the story was more scripted and you maybe had less control over what the what the result was after you finished the mission, um, I think that was that was a pretty good example of the game saying, "Hey, look, if you make these, you know, if you follow these missions to completion, whichever option you you choose is going to have real impact, not just oh." town of dave becomes town of rosie instead and you know, that seems like a trivial impact but the impact of the i think the arafu missions was more real in this particular gameplay moment yeah if if we can just sort of abstract for a second though like when when we we're talking about shadow of the colossus i made a point about meta narratives about postmodernism, but i do think fallout as as much as sort of Fallout talks about these pro-social ideas, how it sets up these social structures, I do still think it's very invested in the meta-narrative of a lone individual. You mean even a lone individual making these changes, a lone individual out in the wastelands, you know, fending for himself, sort of the wandering Ronin, you know, curing evils where he sees them. And I just, I wonder why it is that Fallout, and I would say a lot of games are so invested in this meta narrative of individual hero, especially in apocalyptic games. Like, I can't think, and hopefully you guys maybe can correct me if I'm wrong, like, I can't think of a game that would be like an apocalyptic Sim City, where like the nuclear bomb goes off and then you have to actually rebuild a society. It seems like you're always controlling this lone individual wandering the wastes. And, I mean, it could just be an entertainment issue, like it's more fun that way. But then the question becomes, okay, but why is it more fun for us? Yeah, I think you're right. And I think part of that might just be it's an American it, – most of these games we're talking about are American-made. And True. the investment True. with a single individual overcoming in a wasteland against all odds by themselves, by their own bootstraps, is a profoundly American idea, or at least a Western idea. Um, the – I think of Henry David Thoreau a little bit of him just kind of going off into the woods saying, I'm going to show you what I can do by myself. And I'm going to show everyone how good I am. Quick throw point though. I forget. I think it was him. I'm pretty sure his mom still did his laundry. Yes. Like, his mom. Really? Was that it? Yes. His mom yes. did his laundry <laughs> and his friends helped build his house. All right, so, but you're right that the narrative is a very quintessentially American one. But the narrative, that's the thing. The yeah. narrative of Thoreau is I am building myself up in Walden. If, you know, I am going out into the wilderness, finding my own truth, finding my own way through the world, you know, by examining nature and using my own mind and communing with uh, the world around me. Mm -hmm. However, in reality, he is tied into society. If there are problems, he has society to fall back on. Everything he has is also a result of the society he grew up in and his connections with his friends to help set him up. Um, a lot of the narratives that Americans construct that are these lone wanderer taking care of themselves, like even Mad Max, like even those kind of narratives, ultimately Max comes into society, affects some change, then leaves. But he is not completely <coughs> self-sufficient. There's this implication that, yeah, he's totally doing it all by himself, but when you think about how it plays out in actual the movies or in Fallout, 
you are getting help so many different ways that I think it is an oversimplification to say that, like, there is this romantic ideal of what you're doing, and then there's the reality of it. Um, it is telling you over and over again you're the lone wanderer going in and changing everything, but really, when I'm shot, I really want to see a doctor. <laughs> um, when I need to get stim packs, I really don't want to have to go into an old vault to get it. I'd really rather trade you bottle caps. Um, though there is an odd kind of disconnect with... Uh, how you heal yourself because you can just sleep like anywhere and then you yeah. get healed. Um, but other, but stim packs and bullets and stuff like that, er, at least, especially early on, scavenging is dangerous. Um, once you get a critical mass of bullets and <clears throat> frag grenades and mines, then you can really become self sufficient. And at that point, like it's probably more expeditious to just waste everyone and take all their stuff. Um, but until that point, it's just like you need to f kind of obey society and, and recognize the help around you. Yeah, I think my gameplay experience was kind of uh, bad because I got I, I reached that critical mass from like the second mission. Because when I started the game and the only thing that showed up was those DLC missions, I just got abducted by aliens. And when I finished that mission, <laughs> I had like the best alien weaponry in the game. And then... I stumbled into this other town and got, like, the best power armor in the game, and those were my first two missions. So I guess, I mean, I kind of wish I didn't do that, act actually, because I would have had a better gameplay experience. It would have been more Fallout, where you actually have to, you know, scavenge and survive. But then I wanted to um, to sort of jump on the, the question that Pete raised about, you know, why is it a single character? Why is it a single person? Now, backing up to a more game mechanic mode, I think Gino talked about the whole like meta narrative piece but from a game mechanic you're right be like i can't think of another game where it's a sim city kind of post apocalyptic probably the closest that i can get to is maybe maybe like a day z kind of game and it's only because you have other players in the game with you and it benefits you if you want to play the game and survive to like work together it doesn't behoove you to just kind of go off on your own i guess and get no help from i mean maybe it does depending on how you want to play the game right um but that's probably the closest that i can get to of a sort of a post-apocalyptic game scenario where you are trying to build something together with others as opposed to just being one person acting in a in an environment and i think the reason why that's the default is because when you are actually playing a video game you're probably going to be at your house or, you know, at your place or with friends, but one person's playing. And from a story point, it's probably easier to tell a story or to create game mechanics from a single person perspective in a giant sandbox of interactivity. Yeah, I think it's it also dovetails with uh, games largely indulging in power fantasies as their main narrative drive um, because you're... The advantage of having an apocalyptic situation, just like when we were talking about uh, Shadow of the Colossus and how it's very convenient to have these enemies that are throwaway and meaningless because that allows you to enact violence on them without really caring about the repercussions. Um, by having a situ an apocalyptic situation, you can give this downfall of society, kind of that is that is your basic setting, and then any anarchic... Um, anarchic? Anarchical. Sure, fine. Anarchical. Uh, nah. actions you take, just who cares? Society's destroyed. Um, it's a license to do violence upon others because there's no one there to really stop you. It's kind of an ultimate power fantasy setting if you allow it to be. Um, and also, it's easier to tell... I think it's a little bit easier to tell a story about personal growth when it's told from the first person where it's one person acting yeah. upon the world. And... Um, telling stories of cooperation and togetherness like communal like more than just two people like uh the last of us kind of is a post-apocalyptic game where there is some cooperation and there is some rebuilding of society but it is not um greater than really two characters at it you blend in with some civilizations here and there but it's not really greater actually i guess the walking dead kind of shows people trying to band together and form um, I was, a lasting I was thinking, society. I was thinking maybe Left for Dead, if we were looking at sort of 
community-based post-apocalyptic games. But even that's not that different from Fallout in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, if you play The Walking Dead um, game by Telltale, there's definitely some uh, community building and people struggling and banding together uh, to try and get through an apocalyptic situation. They know that they can't rebuild society, but they try to... It's about largely about looking out for other people. But I think that the... Just the readiness to accept a narrative based largely on, you know, escapist fantasy kind of makes indulging in destruction and a really selfish narrative and worldview, it makes it very easy. And so people lean into it. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought up the point about sort of the connection between the apocalypse and violence. Like the apocalyptic scenario becomes a sanction for violence. Because this brings us sort of back to that Hobbesian framework we started with. Like, if you look at Hobbes, the state's main job is to limit the violence inherent in the state of of nature. Like, were we in a state of nature, we would just be behaving violently all the time. But if you look at sort of the way the state functions in actual society, if we're looking at violence, sort of the state's job in many cases is to enable violence, right? It's not to train people to suppress it. It's to train people to activate sort of their violent tendencies. Like if you look at sort of historical war examples, the vast majority of infantry troops in World War II only fired their weapons at a rate of 15 to 20 percent. So only like 20 percent of soldiers really shot to kill. So to ask sort of, sort of, it's a fantasy of, of capability first off. Like you can train multiple different skills in Fallout. But in a lot of sense, it's sort of a capability for violence that we're sort of enacting, right? It becomes a problematic wish fulfillment, which I mean, we don't... Video games are often a problematic wish fulfillment yeah, if right? you really I'm, think about it. We don't need to get to one of that, but just... Oh, man. <laughs> the question of why it is... Like, the, the, the reason I brought up this question is because I see this as a narrative of capability, we all like to imagine ourselves of being capable to survive as an individual. But why is there this sort of inherent pride in individual capability, especially the capability to perform acts of violence when faced with this sort of sanctioning environment? Yeah. Um, I, I, respond to. I didn't know that that tiger had so many deep things to say about chaos and the violence and the nature yeah. of man. Calvin it, I, is... There's one smart stuff, Tiger. I think the dad has the most interesting things to say in that that comic, but I'm not um, disappointed. You mentioned some stuff about like about how, and let me make sure that I got your point right. Yeah, that, it, it sprawled. So let's make that, sure we all got my point right. right. That you were kind of wondering why is it turning to violence as the act of as the act of you know creating yourself sort of in the this scenario. Old- yeah, the ultimate expression of apocalyptic capability, let's say. Like you're okay. capable of surviving because you can enact this violence. So I'm not saying that was – I'm not saying that's wrong. Please but let me do, just share my game experience. So what I wanted to build my character as, my character, her name was Sloan, and I wanted to build her as a stealthy, sneaky, charismatic, avoid conflict, but – get you know like resolutions in your missions kind of character and i was able to do that to a degree for the wrong reason and i'll explain that in a second um but i wanted to avoid killing as much like as many people as i could but still achieve the objective and that would have been crazy hard i think in fallout not like it's the wrong way to play but that would have been a very difficult way to play because if you put your special points into like strength and endurance and all that stuff, I think you're going to have a way easier time in the early game. It may be harder to get some of those um, like fine tuning skills later, like medicine or like um, or like lock picking or charisma or like it may have been harder to get those later. But the way I built my character was supposed to be this cunning, charismatic, stealthy character. The reason it kind of got foiled was because I got, like, the best armor in the game, so I could just walk by bullets and not have to worry about it. That's how I was stealthy. Um, But I think you're right, Pete, that if I had chosen the more violent option, I would have had a way easier time in-game just completing objectives. 
And it's almost like the game was built around, you know, if you just, you know, shoot this guy in the head, it'll be a little bit easier. I think I think what struck me in this context is the fact that you can just sort of step out of the vault ready to go, like an elite warf not elite in terms of skill, but like you can walk out of the vault and just shoot everybody, I guess, if you wanted to. And that makes more sense if you're playing a game like Halo, right? Right. Where you're a Spartan, you've been bred for this, you've been built, literally built for this. In a game like Fallout, where you're sort of more or less a regular citizen to just step out and perform at this high capability, this is where I see us returning to that Hobbesian narrative that I want to try to resist. Yeah, and the thing that I thought immediately was, um, when you say violence is kind of an ultimate, that is the emblem of capability, um, in Fallout, one of the only options that you have at all times is violence. Um, it's when a constant. You want, when you want to, no, I mean like to solve a problem, yeah. like when you want to affect change, you will have maybe one or two chances to talk your way through something. You might have a skill check. Um, if you cannot talk your way through something, usually the answer is shoot that guy. Um, I saw, for example, um, the first time I played this game, I was doing the Arafu mission. And I screwed up uh, one of, like, my dialogues with the kind of uh, vampire dudes. And I then, like, stole something while one of them was looking. At which point, they no longer would talk to me. There was nothing I could do to talk to them ever again. They would only try and shoot me. And the only answer for me to make things right, and not even make things right, to end the... the um, the mission to end the quest was kill all of them was waste all of them and then go back to the place where my mission was given um once things go bad in the world of fallout and people turn on you your only choice for a resolution other than to leave them be and say that quest line's broken is to kill everyone um and i think that that's a really it's a flaw of i guess it's a flaw of imagination it's a that you can't come to some sort of peaceful agreement or some way to reconcile. Like, something so small as, like, stealing some in a, in a world like this, stealing something while someone's looking, you should be able to give it back. You should be able to try and talk them down, maybe. Um, but you can't. Once you've made that transgression, there's no going back. And the only answer is to either completely abandon that place or destroy it. Um, and, I, and I just think it's really problematic. <laughs> I agree with you that it's a flaw in imagination, but I think it's not so much a flaw in the imagination of the game designers as it is a flaw in the imagination of this overall apocalyptic meta narrative. Like the whether they were aware of it or not, I think the game designers were hamstrung by this idea that this is how you behave in the apocalypse. It's this Hobbesian doggy dog world, so what you have to do is kill to survive. And I mean, in sort of the ultimate irony, there are multiple times in the game where I found myself unable to get a better gun, so I killed everybody in the way of me getting this superior gun. It's just, it's an odd feeling to, to needlessly kill for an improved method of killing. Welcome to video games. Yeah, that man. is an odd, like, an odd sort of vicious cycle. But it's, it's worse than Fallout because it's like... <clears throat> It's not hyper realistic, but it's like if if I'm again comparing it to Halo, like it's just it's worse somehow in Fallout. I actually yeah. got uh I, I actually got really good gear before I stumbled into my get the best gear missions because <laughs> like a glitch happened in the game and I ran into this enclave member and I had one grenade and I threw it at him and he got shot up like fifty feet in the air and like the fall damage killed him and I and I took all his stuff. But that was not supposed to happen in the game. He spent about <laughs> he spent about eighteen seconds just walking on some platform in the sky that didn't exist until he fell down and died. Sounds I would like have, Fallout. Yeah, I would have gotten wasted by that Enclave member because they have like this sweet like Spartan laser rifle. Yeah. But I had I had one magic grenade <laughs> that ended it all. Yeah, I think one of the things that I noticed playing this game is that usually your greatest fear is not of the enemies that are trying to kill you. One, because the AI is pretty dumb. Yeah, it um, is. It really does. Dumb. Like, there were multiple times where my answer to an enemy was putting a tree between me and it and then running in a... Like, standing behind the tree, waiting till my vats filled up, step out behind the tree, bop, 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 run back behind the tree, 
play Ring Around the Rosie with the tree, and then they never <laughs> found me. What I level are you guys? Uh, seven or eight? No, nine. Probably nine. Yeah, I'm like something fairly high. I forget. I'm like level twenty five right now. I know. I, I like. I maxed out the the vat ability. I know that. Like, if you kill everybody, you get it all back. Oh yeah, the grim, like the grim reaper. Yeah, the one. grim. I was like, sign that me one's up for so that. good. Like, all my problems. Anytime you kill somebody, free vats refill. Yeah. All my problems with sort of the meta narrative of violence in the apocalypse, I still maxed out all my gun based stats. <clears throat> like, despite first, all my rhetoric. The first stat that I maxed was barter and speech, because that just made everything basically free in the game. Yeah, see, you guys played the game in a way much more sympathetic to my vision of the apocalypse than I myself did. So what you're saying is we are the real hope in the future. The third one that I maxed was small weapons, but two out of the three first weapon, like the skills that I maxed were speech, barter, and small weapons. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's another one where at a certain point you need to max a weapon. Like Mm -hmm. there's no answer for you to get away from these enemies without killing at a certain point. Not and on your first are, playthrough. There are enemies that are like, you know, they're animals. You're you're not going to speech check your way around you a rabbit dog. You could just get dog. the animal friend perk and then animals stop attacking you. You're not going to oh, mean like the death super ball. late in the game when at that point they're trivial? Dude, that's like level 10. That's still late enough that you really shouldn't be That's cuz you don't get levels. <laughs> I, I didn't I Level didn't kill a lot. You know his head. He just doesn't understand them. I actually got yeah, stuck I, in a part of the game and had to look up like uh like how to find this entrance and then the guy who said, "Yeah, I was like doing a playthrough. At this time I was level 9 and I was like, "Oh, man, I'm like level 20 right now." <laughs> yeah, I didn't the, there's definitely a level inflation in the DLC. It it levels you real fast. Um I I just thought it was very weird that Oftentimes what's stopping you from killing things in the game isn't a fear of the enemies that you're dealing with. It's a fear that you'll run out of bullets or ways to kill them. Yeah, like true. I, I almost yeah. never – once I had a good gun and a cache of bullets, I was never scared of running into pretty much any enemy type. Like a Deathclaw, whatever. I've got a mini nuke. I can take out any <laughs> enemy that I want. If something needs to die, it will die. <laughs> but – once I am, like, dwindling on hunting rifle ammo or whatever type of ammo I'm using pretty frequently, at that point I'm like, okay, now if I run into enemies I'm going to be in trouble because I don't have enough bullets for its brain. Um, and that, I think, is a really odd situation because you are never scared for your own personal safety. Like, you could yeah. be low on stim packs, you could be low on anything. As long as you've got enough bullets, you're fine. And it's a really odd depiction of the, of the end of the world it- where it's... It even makes it easy to enact this sort of violence, like the slow motion that targeting. Like you just, oh, I guess I'll shoot him in the head. The percentages are good. You don't even have to aim. You can open vats, put the controller down, walk away, just come back and get a headshot. <laughs> Best way to take a bathroom him. break, you know. It's the ultimate fantasy of capability. Yeah. I can take a small tangent and say, like, if I could ever be granted one superpower. It'd be like manipulating time, getting that sort of like a uh, matrix bullet kind of uh, kind of superpower. If I had one superpower, it'd be canceling your time manipulation. I would just go around ruining your superpower. <laughs> what a dick, man. <laughs> Imagine if you could just like slow down time, but your favorite reference is still the same. You know, somebody throws a baseball at you and you just say, oh, man, put my hand right there. Catch it. Start Wait. time when I feel like it. But imagine if your superpower was to fuck with you yeah, trying to do that. Just to it's ruin like, one of us. You guys ever person. read those like uh, like most useless superpower like comics or like they'll make little infographs just for funny like purposes? What's the useless superpowers? Like one of them that was that was uh, pretty good. You can run the speed of light, but only when your eyes are closed. So you just run into things. Oh no. You activate it by closing your eyes. You have super speed running, but you have to close your eyes to run. I've got a spotter. They sit on my back, and yeah, right. They, due to relativity, they, <laughs> it's okay. Dude, uh, immortal. Well, okay. So we've back talked to fall. about yeah. For, just a question: Did both of you pick Bloody Mess as a? Perk? No, I didn't get Bloody Mess. Which one was Bloody Mess again? That was um, the one where it made their bodies like explode, and uh, they get, like a five percent flat rate of. 
it's ten percent extra damage to all enemies. Yeah, I, I did five percent to all enemies. It's was it ten, 10 or five? really? Eh. I did bloody mess. Yeah, I didn't get it. You no, know, the nice part about bloody mess, you can loot all the giblets. <laughs> like, all the, you know what it I just makes it easier like? to loot. Was like every time you killed somebody in Vats, there was like a nine second slow mo cutscene of their head being exploded. Like, yeah, I didn't like that. I wanted it to is, skip that. It is or gratuitous. turn it off. Not just gratuitous, but like I want to get on with the game. <laughs> it's just too slow for me. Yeah, there's like a there's like a ten or eleven second. You gotta just like watch some guy's body just bounce around a little bit while his head rolls down a hill. Yeah, and then when their head rolls down the hill, you can't loot the head. It's the worst. Right? Oh, you can loot the head. You can loot any any piece. So we. We've talked about sort of meta narratives with capability and violence and Hobbes and all that. Gino, did you want to ask why patriarchy persists in the apocalypse? I kind of do, just because. Yeah, bring it up, well, man. I, I, I mean, it clearly does. There is no matriarchy that I saw in any of them, but I found three patriarchies that I wanted to take out. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Let's discuss. There was there was the Republic of Dave, uh, handled election rigged. Um, there was uh, Paradise Falls, which is run by a pimp who has uh, two girls that he has enslaved, and they turn on you when you shoot him. Yeah. Which, yeah. which is a real bummer. Um, I didn't want to shoot them as well, but I had to because I wanted to live more. Um, and then uh, there's also Vault 101, the place you start. You can it. It's run by the overseer, and it's basically a propagation of 1950s society. That's also a thing that I think is pretty interesting. That Fallout is basically set in an apocalypse that happens after 1950s society dominated all of America. Um, and so, since Vault 101 is basically set up to replicate the society that went into the vault, um, it is a patriarchy by by default. Um, so let me push back a little bit. I'm not going to say you're entirely wrong because all the well-established <laughs> cities, like you mentioned, they did have some kind of like council or charismatic leader. And most of the time it was a guy or somehow male, male run. But when I looked around at the different groups, maybe they weren't cities or towns or settlements by themselves, but maybe they were the outcasts. Or maybe they were um, – I'm drawing a blank on the other names of the groups, but um, one of them is um, – shoot, like – The Brotherhood of Steel? Or not the Brotherhood of Steel. The one where you get the perk well, there's no where sisterhood of steel. you put like a finger – like you get like a finger off of the bad guys. Isn't the leader of that group a female? The law? Like the lawbringer place? The perk is called lawbringer. And then you only – get to this town if you activate that perk and i think the leader of it is a female this like lawbringer group i can't remember what it's called i'm pretty sure it's a female leader but that's not just my point but if you run into these people all the soldiers you find aren't just dude soldiers there's also female soldiers in rivet city there's like a three-person council and one out of three is a female not saying that that's completely you know bringing like saying that it's not a patriarchy but you know, there is representation, and sure, it's not 100% or 50-50, but it's still representation. Yeah, but what I'm arguing is not that everywhere is a patriarchy. I'm saying those three specific locations are set up, de facto, like, they are... Literal Dave has two wives. Dave has two wives. No one else has any wives. Dave sets it up so that the women, basically, the votes are rigged because he only brings in sycophants and makes it so that he wins all of the elections. He is the only one with kids. It is literally a patriarchy. Uh, the overseer is always a guy. Um, he strictly enforces gender norms and makes sure that the men have power and guns and women are in the home doing work. You're right. Literally a patriarchy. Um, Paradise Falls. Women. There's one woman, I think. There's a uh, – the medic is a woman. There is one wo female slaver. But the person who runs it is a pimp who has two women enslaved. Um, they are all set up as patriarchies. Now, the issue of, re like, representation, equal representation might make it, like, not a, not a patriarchy, but that does not then make it a matriarchy. A woman being in charge does not mean that women in that society are empowered as a whole and w men are disempowered. You'd also, you'd also expect in such sort of, like, wide-ranging society there, that there'd be one sort of, for lack of a more technical term, Amazonian type of society where like the whole ruling class or maybe even all the inhabitants are women and not that that's sort of 
not that that doesn't have its own problems in sort of advancing gender narratives, but you'd expect like there'd be some sort of society like that, considering how many different sort of social structures you see in the game. Especially considering in this game, genders are equal functionally, like yeah. health, health. The way that you deal damage, I did not notice a gender imbalance in power. Also, the main way of dealing damage in this game is guns. It is something that is that doesn't care about the gender of the person pulling the trigger. So in a game where, by and large, everyone is equal, still these power structures are replicated. And I think, like, to one one extent, I saw, like, Vault 101 as a replication of 50s society, and that was kind of a commentary on 50s society. I thought the Republic of Dave was a reflection of the egomania of Dave himself. Right. Um, and then Paradise Falls is kind of, it's an evil place. It is shown as evil. There's All three of these places are commenting on patriarchy and showing how absurd it is that Dave has a museum dedicated to himself with a woman whose job it is to tell you about Dave. <laughs> Like, all of them are commentaries on patriarchy and how bad it can be. Like, no one wants to live in Vault 101. It's a pretty miserable place. They will, you will get called back there. There's a mission to go back and overthrow the overseer. Yeah. Like, um, even though that there are these commentaries, it's just odd that there's no representation of the opposite. Or even some sort of uh, supposition as to what would be the problems with a matriarchy how it could be just as bad as a patriarchy. Or maybe it isn't. I don't know. Like, it just doesn't exist. Like, they show a society ran entirely by children, but they don't show a society ran entirely by women. And it's odd. Yeah, it's, now that you mention it, it's a weird sort of split between these indications of how bad a patriarchy would be, like how monomaniacal and egomaniacal you'd have to be to create one, but there's still no indication of sort of a strong woman-centered society. Yeah, and like... That is strange. The, the cool thing about Fallout 3 is that each of those towns is a little vignette. It's yeah. a little example of what could have happened in an apocalyptic situation. It's almost like a series of short stories more than it is one cohesive game, which is kind of its own problem. But... Uh, You've got all these different towns with their different setups, and you've got a town dedicated to kind of hippieism. I don't know if you found Oasis, but it is one of the only places in. It's kind of in a val. It's like it's in, in an mountain. oasis. No, it's in a mountain, kind of with one way in, and it's very easy to miss. But it's one of the only places with uh, green with trees. Uh, it's centered around a mutant who had a tree growing into him. I did find that. Now that you mentioned the mutant tree. Okay. Yeah. Oasis centered around kind of a future hippie society. Um, you've got uh, Little Lamplight, ran by kids. Big Town, ran by kids who never had adults um, and don't know how to deal with adult life, really. They're all stunted emotionally. Um, you have Megaton, which is just kind of people scrapping by to get by. Um, you have uh, Tenpenny Tower, which is run by... I don't know if that's a patriarchy, but it is. it is capitalist. It is hugely capitalist or oligarchical um and that's got its problems there's under uh the underworld which is all ghouls kind of trying to get by um and all these different representations exist but no women with so there are places where women are in charge but there are no places where women enforce strictly that women must always be in charge and that men must be second class citizens and i think it's i mean you don't have to do it but it's an odd oversight in a game where so many other um, fantasies are indulged. True, true. Do you have any other points you want to hit on about community building in post-apocalyptic scenarios? No, I think just sort of in summation, I think we can see sort of a commitment within the apocalyptic genre overall and Fallout in a lot of ways resists it, but in some ways capitulates it, capitulates to it. But I think you can see a distinct meta narrative that embraces the Hobbesian vision of a nasty, brutish, short state of nature in which individuals enact sort of violent capabilities. And I just wonder why, in this genre specifically, where sort of society crumbles and we can rebuild it, why we're so invested in this meta narrative. And I don't know if there's a good answer for it. It's just sort of yeah, an interesting well, question. In my apocalyptic literature class that I took in college, uh, someone invest someone actually looked into um, apocalyptic dance music 
Right. And why, uh, yeah, that was one of their final presentations was that um, a lot of music nowadays is talking, like Kesha, we're going to party. Oh. Hey, Pete, the greatest, what do you think about Pete, Kesha? The greatest yes. singer of our generation. Kesha. Kesha, if you're listening to our podcast, track me down. I think we'd really hit it off. Someone, If somebody knows Kesha, get this into her hand so I can meet her. That's my, my shameless plug for mine and Kesha's future wedding. I'll say to Kesha, Pete is definitely worth meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Billy, for the backup. You can call me the wingman and at the uh, at the reception. I'm there not your you best man, actually, because there's no other else. <laughs> nobody else on your team right now. <laughs> yeah, so the reason why they talked about apocalyptic dance music was that modern a lot of modern pop songs su- suppose that the end of the world is coming soon and we should just act as free and as hedonistic hedonistically as we can because the end of the world's coming and you only yolo and all that stuff <laughs> these kids were there yolo these days <laughs> and it just lets you be as hedonistic and as basic as you can be and i think that these games indulge in that same fantasy and i think that as we're seeing so many different apocalyptic uh fantasies happening nowadays I think it's repeating itself, and it's just an outlet to have these basic feelings just and act upon them with no consequence or no fear of consequence. Good points. Good points. Yeah, so what do we think? Any other last thoughts about Fallout? Like, any any other thoughts? I mean, um, great game. I had a lot of fun, and I'll probably play it to completion. Um, I found it Real really fun. kind of, like, buggy, but... That's just because I like to break games. I like to poke around in places where I probably shouldn't or like yeah, jump snap the disc up and down. Half, Not snap the disc, but I'm talking like there were times where I was exploring the wasteland and just got stuck between two rocks and I couldn't move ahead to reset the game, you know? Like yep. that, that kind of stuff happened. Um, Sounds there was like actually, Fallout. Actually, man, this really weird scenario occurred where I was in one of the DLC missions and... Your DLC... Well, it was on the disc. Like, I couldn't choose not to see it when I started the game. But, like, I would just, like, get, like, get stuck in dialogue, and I'd press the only dialogue option, and then it would just, like, freeze. There would be stuff happening around me. People would be shooting themselves and dying. But I just couldn't move at all, and nothing would hurt me. I would just get stuck. It was really weird. Um, but, yeah, the game was a lot of fun, strictly because I like being rewarded for exploration. And so you definitely get that in Fallout. We actually did a, a deep look about it. Gino and I did a, a deep look about, again, Shadow of the Colossus, probably one of my favorite games, um, about how exploration re- rewards you. And I like that part about this game, too, that if you explore, you get rewarded with little, like, you, you find weird towns or you find weird people or you find cool items that maybe you would have not seen otherwise if you didn't go off off the beaten path and explore some. Yeah, and I, my favorite gl- – so I have two favorite glitches. One um, in – Big Town with my I, I think my version of the game is missing some patches, so there is an infinite uh, speech check you can do in Big Town talking to one of the kid, I guess he's not a kid anymore, one of the people there about their relationship with um, Bittercup, the goth girl of the wastelands, and you can just keep talking to him about it over and over and over again, and you get seven experience every time you talk to him. So I just that's how I grind it. That's levels. how you leveled. You know, in yes. the DLC missions, you can uh, you can be on the alien spaceship uh, and you can blow up Canada, and uh, you can also press a button that fills a room full of bad guys that can't hurt you. You can just waste them all and just get tons of experience. I got probably three and a half levels in five minutes for that. That's how so you. What you're saying is, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. how you did it. I just got bored. I could have gone to thirty in like a like oh, 30. twenty-five minutes. What a champ you are! Oh man, killing those things Could've. that couldn't fight back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we um, and then my second favorite was one time I was sitting in the chair for the goat to take the test at the beginning of the game, and I got stuck in the chair. Like so I was literally the stuck goat. in the chair. Yep, couldn't move. <laughs> was stuck taking the goat forever. Yeah, and one time I um, when you tell Lucas Sims about the person trying to blow up the bomb in Megaton, he'll confront him. And then uh, the guy who's trying to blow up Megaton will draw a gun and kill Lucas Sims if you um, let, tell Lucas to go check him out. Uh, I knew that that happened, so I told Lucas. And then right before, like, when the guy drew the gun, I batsed him and blew his head off. However, the scripting of the game was such that Lucas, 
I guess even though he drew the gun and didn't shoot, Lucas, it was beyond the point where Lucas has to die, so Lucas just exploded. <laughs> Lucas just had to die. He just died. Like, the, the scripting just happened Drop anyway. Dead. It was his time. Yep. He was startled by the gun and just, ah! I kind of just fat-fingered and shot that guy by accident, causing a huge firefight in the uh, in the place. Like, there was some guy sitting next to him. Like, I don't know if this is the same in every game, but when you would Lucas go up to the guy who tries to sell you, like, or, like, uh, tries to get you to blow up Megaton, there's just, like, some random merc in the chair. And I was pointing at the guy who's trying to get you to blow up Megaton with a crosshair on him, and I just kind of slipped and was like, oh, shit, I just shot him. Uh, what what happens now? Kill everyone but Lucas. And I had to, I had to, I had to kill that guy, too. He started shooting so at me. So what you're, what you're saying is I got nervous. They, gave you, they gave you a house, and they recognized you as a hero after you murdered the entirety of the bar. No, not, not, the, not everyone in the bar. Just anyone who had a gun that started shooting at me. Like, and they were cool with the it. The ghoul That's guy didn't start shooting at me. Very casual town. The hooker didn't start shooting at me. I See, I slept with her that night. She was cool with it. Oh, snap, son. Oh, crap. You paid a... a see, patriarchy. There you uh, go. I'm a female character, and she's still sold to me. Yep. So on that amazing note, <laughs> let's end this discussion about Fallout and Hobbesian morality. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, um, talk about, let's talk about next next podcast. Yeah, Billy, why don't you tell us about what next podcast is going to be? Right after the phone stops ringing. Hang on a second. Is the phone done ringing? Yeah, so Ring. on that note, um, let's let's talk about next week. All right, cool. What are we talking about next week, Billy? I guess I guess if it's going to be my pick, I'm going to throw it back a little bit to when Gina and I went to PAX East. I saw a really cool panel about relationships and games, and I really wanted to – ask the panel a question unfortunately i was waiting in line and was the very next person in line before they cut the line and i couldn't ask the question so i'm pretty i'm pretty bummed but what i wanted to ask was what are some good examples or why don't we see more of this and it is relationships in games where it's not purely romantic or sexual um it's not purely like driven by desire or romance or sexuality but meaningful relationships in games that are like you need them to drive the story and they're not just like a side quest and they're not romantic or sexual in nature okay so that's kind of hard to find but uh, i did a little bit of digging and there are some games like that um some good examples are actually walking dead where you have characters like lee and clementine last of us with joel and ellie um, you have Left for Dead with the two, sorry, not Left for Dead. Um, Half Life Two has the protagonist and that lady who he follows around. Well, I don't know about that because Gordon doesn't talk. Yeah, and also is barely a character. Yeah, pretty but much. You can but see you the have, love in his crowbar. Just um, the way he swings it. Mm-hmm. Something like Bioshock Infinite is not a is not a terrible example. Um, other games like Near or Nier is like a is like a Square Enix game that came out. Ico. Or Eco is a good example, but I don't want to play another game by the same developer for this podcast. So I don't know what exactly game I want to play or if we're just going to play one. Like, what do you guys think? Do you want to play three different games or one game? I'm open for Okay, game. Pete, what is your console syst- uh, situation? It's poor. Uh, what are what are we dealing with? Just Xbox 360? Yeah, um, maybe a PS2. So I don't know. Okay. Um, so I was thinking we could divide and conquer. We could try something new. Okay. Is, down for that. Sure. Uh, so, Pete, do you think you could get a hold of Left 4 Dead? Uh, not Left 4 Dead, um, uh, The Walking Dead. Yeah. I think I, you would enjoy that. I'll take a stab at it. Uh, Gino, hey, have Billy. you played that? Yes, I have played that. Okay. Um, I am most of the way through um, The Last of Us. I played all the way through Last of Us. So I would like to finish that. And then Billy, I've never played Bioshock Infinite or Near or anything. Have you played Bio? You you played Bioshock, right? I have played Bioshock Infinite. So I've, I've played the first, not the second. So okay. So Pete, why don't you try to play one of either one of Bioshock Infinite and or and or The Walking Dead or both? Or why don't we just do it so Pete, you play Bioshock Infinite, Billy, you play Bioshock Infinite, I'll play The End of the Last of Us. I've played Bioshock Infinite, so um, all right. 
Sounds it'll good. be infinite and the last of us and we can uh, rope some other things in if we're gonna play six. two games why not why not play three that's tr- i mean i'm just saying that way we're i've all also on never the same played page. walking dead all right well billy why don't you take walking dead then and i'll take bioshock infinite okay that good yeah all right okay all right cool Okay, so we're going to do three games. So I'm going to be finishing off The Last of Us. Pete, you're going to be playing... Bioshock Infinite. And Billy? Walking Dead. Okay. This is going to be a pretty big one. So uh, we might be spoiling three games, but whatever. (laughs) All of them came out years ago. We already spoiled three games. That's true. We're We're just going to give you everything you got in the last three podcasts, but better. Well, deep listens is not about avoiding spoilers. It is about going deep it's and about listening. It's about what enhancing spoilers. call it spoilers. shallow listens. Welcome to shallow listens. This is my new podcast where we talk <laughs> about things for about two seconds. Fallout and... three, good game done. <laughs> yes, Fallout three is good. It was good, but buggy done. <laughs> bombs, oh. bombs and ghouls. Bombs and ghouls, and no one wants to have sex with ghouls. <laughs> Smooth skin. Yep. Yeah, so we out. Uh, if so, for this, if you want to get in touch with Deep Listens, just go ahead and drop an email to thatpinguino at gmail dot com. We will add it to the beginning of the podcast and and add you to the discussion. It'll be great. Um, for Gino, peace. Uh, Bill, Billy. Later, everybody. Thanks for tuning in one more time. Pete. Pete. Thanks for listening, everybody. Send those emails. We want to hear from you. All right, you join. Yes, send emails and let's do that. Peace. Later, y'all. Peace.